The Periodic Effects Cannabis Business Podcast is brought to you by Periodic Edibles, the Cannabis Caramel Company, available in Oregon. You, in fact, had a comment you wanted to make, Richard. Well, it's rather moved on. I mean, I was just going to say I can't imagine why anyone should think it was an ethical problem. I could see why they might think it was a Hello, welcome back, and thank you for joining us again. My name is Wayne, and I'll be your host for the Periodic Effects Cannabis Business and Science Podcast. So this is part two of a special episode we put out. Um, This is episode 51. Part one was episode 50, our 50th episode, and we titled this one Cannabis Science 101 from Newbie to Novice. So if you haven't listened to part one yet, um, I highly recommend going back and checking that one out first before listening to this episode. And again, part one was just episode 50, so the one right before this. And that one really covers really a nice foundation of the different components of cannabis, what's in the plant, and it really parlays nicely into this episode. And so this episode is part two, and we really made part two, um, or it really focuses on like I said, different dosing uh, and ailments and how to select cannabis products and how what questions to ask when going into a dispensary or a retailer. So you have some background knowledge. You know, cannabis, there's a lot of different complexities and nuances. And if you're not familiar with cannabis, maybe you used it, you know, 30 years ago, one time, and now it's finally the stigmas removing. There's a legitimate, professional, sophisticated market out there. And it can be kind of overwhelming or daunting if you're looking at, you know, using cannabis again or trying it out. So we really made these two episodes, part one and part two, um, episode 50 and 51, for cannabis consumers that either know nothing about cannabis or they're unfamiliar with it. They knew a few different things. They know there's different products out there, but they don't know much about like, well, you know, why does one help you sleep through the night? And why does one make you a little more like uppity and make you want to go out and do something? And what about for pain? What do I use for that? So that's really the goal of this to answer those questions and also provide a nice foundational understanding for bud tenders that might be just starting in cannabis and, you know, first week at a store not familiar with cannabis, slightly familiar, really just to provide a good understanding just to help, you know, education in general all around cannabis. And please, we made this for everybody, you know, grandma that's 90 years old, your cousin who's 22, a bud tender, you know, all across the board. This episode, I'm hoping, provides a lot of value and education. So please share this with your friends and family. Um, I think, like we said, you know, helping with the education and awareness. And the goal is really to remove the stigma that's still lingering from prohibition and also get rid of some of the myths that people still carry around around cannabis, like sativa versus indica. Does that have anything to do with effects? Turns out it doesn't, which we really discuss in uh, the last part one, episode 50. So check that out if you haven't. But, you know, remove those myths and just expose cannabis to the general public for, you know, the way it should be. So really easy. Um, would really appreciate if you shared this. If you're listening on a podcast app or even using our app, just take a screenshot of the phone while the podcast is playing. Super simple. And then upload that to Instagram or Facebook, whichever one you use most. And then just uh, tag us in it if you'd like. You know, at Periodic Effects is our podcast. That simple. Real quick. Do a screenshot. Share to Instagram, share to Facebook, tag us, and uh, let your friends and family know more about cannabis education um, and help remove some stigma and myths that are out there. If you have someone you want to share this episode with, there's really uh, three different ways you can go about listening to these. So one is probably the most common is there's podcast apps out there. So, you know, uh, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, even on Spotify now, you can listen to podcasts. So Um, We're available in all those locations, so if you already have one of those apps, um, your friend does, just tell them to look for periodic effects. We'll show up and listen to episode 50 first, and then this one is episode 51. Another way to do it, and actually um, this worked really well for my mother, actually, who doesn't never had a podcast app, completely unfamiliar um, with those and didn't like using them, thought they were too complicated. So we have our own app, which is super simple and easy to use, and she loves it now. After using the apps, she's like, oh, I can listen to every episode. This is so nice. I, lo- I love this. And it's like, 
you know, just that simple. Using an app uh, or having her own instead of a regular podcast app worked for her. So maybe that works for someone you know. Um, I think it's especially easier for, um, you know, older generation that's not as tech savvy. The app is super simple, super easy. Just go in the app store on any phone, look for periodic effects. Our app will show up. And literally when you click on that thing, like the most recent episode is right there. You have to hit all you got to do is hit play. You don't got to shuffle through a bunch of lists or find the one you like and all this other stuff. So really easy to use. And the third way is if you don't want to listen on the phone, or you could still listen on the phone this way, I guess, is going to our website. So we made a nice um, landing homepage that has these episodes at the top and then all the past cannabis uh, science of cannabis episodes that we've done. If you want to learn more after listening to these kind of, you know, foundational primer episodes and you can send people there or go there yourself. And that's just www.periodiceffects.com slash 101. And we'll have these episodes here and also more information so you can discover more about the science of cannabis. And I think that's it. All right, let's get into this episode. I'm really excited for this one. Um, really liked episode 50. I think this one's just as good. A lot of good uh, bits of information in here. So we got Emma Chasen with us today, educating us more further like she always does in the best way possible on the science of cannabis. And we'll get started. So there's a lot of different cannabis products. You know, you can smoke it, drink it, eat it, put it on your skin, patch. Like, <laughs> how does a new time, first time consumer start with selecting a product and making that decision of which one to use? And I'd like to get into dosing after that, but just starting, like what, mm. what product should they pick? You know, how do yeah. they decide that? Yeah. Um, I I would really encourage them to make that choice based off of their lifestyle, first and foremost. So Mm. what's going to make sense for them to kind of most easily integrate it into their lifestyle. Um, I know some people whose smoking is just completely off the table. And so we take smoking off the table (laughs) and we look at topicals or um, vaping if that is something that's still on the table for them or edibles. And then we really talk about dosing. Um, For the novices who are kind of like, I'm open to anything, uh, then typically I would encourage them to smoke, um, to try that out just because with edibles, you can really like get yourself into quite a long experience, um, especially if you don't know your dose, if you're really not prepared, it can become very intense very quickly. And so looking to flower that has that whole, um, that is that whole plant medicine has that full spectrum and really giving them the dosing tools to make sure that they don't have a bad experience. Um, but then some other people need something that again, um, maybe doesn't, doesn't require them to inhale anything hot into their lungs, but they also want something that's immediate and very discreet. And so then we could look at something maybe like a lozenge, which they could put under their tongue or a tincture that they could put into smoothie or something like that. Um, so they could easily dose throughout the day and anything that's going to be more sublingual, meaning that um, it's kind of bypassing your digestive system, going directly into the bloodstream through the mouth uh, under the tongue will achieve a more immediate effect, a quicker activation time than something like an edible, which could take very long. Um, but if there's some, if there's somebody who's using it for sleep, then maybe an edible makes most sense because it could help them sleep through the night. So there's, there are a lot of different options for a lot of different people. And really it's dependent on, okay, what makes most sense for your lifestyle? And also what kind of experience do you want to achieve? Um, and, and that will really determine what consumption method works for you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good one to talk to bud tenders about is that Definitely. activation time and then length of, you know, how long is that experience going to last? Cause yeah, edible is a lot different than smoking. <laughs> um, yeah. But you know, if you're, if you're brand new to cannabis, even, you know, something that simple, like you don't, you might not know that. Right. Like you might think the edible works immediately and lasts for an hour. Cause that's how, you know, two hours like flower, but yeah, bud tenders will definitely all should probably have a really good knowledge base on product, different products and those things that they will understand and be able to give you good information. I certainly hope so. I feel like that is like <laughs> definite like butt tender Starting 101 out. must, must know that. And in my yeah. experience, they have, which yeah. is good. Great, great. Um, so people with different ailments, you know, we talked about pain or anxiety or sleep. 
Is there any information we could give them on where to start with products for different ailments that might be kind of specific that Mm. we know work really well for these certain things? Mm, Yeah. Um, I think that in general, a good option would to start with a very low dose of an equal concentration of both THC and CBD um, or like a two to one CBD to THC ratio. So five milligrams of CBD, two and a half milligrams of THC. I think that that's a really kind of good, safe starting place for people to figure out, oh, no, okay, I do have a sensitivity to THC and I really didn't like it. Mm. So maybe we move more into the CBD realm or um, I want more THC, whatever it may be. Um, In general, Anything or any kind of disorder like the Dravet syndrome, um, like seizure disorders, muscle spasm disorders, a higher concentration of CBD seems to be more effective. Um, Also, when looking to manage anxiety and depression, higher concentrations of CBD seem to be more effective. Um, When looking to manage pain, that equal concentration of THC to CBD seems to be the most effective there. Um, When looking to help offset the the different symptoms that may come from chemotherapy or cancer treatment, again, equal concentrations of CBD to THC seem to help. Um, For for like really like trying to uh, manage cancer without chemotherapy, a higher dose of THC may be the way to go. Um, If you're trying to achieve a really sedative response, a higher THC level may be the way to go. Um, For a novice, so for somebody who has never consumed, even if they may be coming in for a really serious medical condition, I don't recommend to start with a high dose of THC. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because of those negative experiences that can occur, it can really scare people from not wanting to go there. And so it's always safer to start with low dose, close to one to one ratio of CBD to THC, maybe even a little bit more CBD than THC. and, and maybe even also having some kind of product on hand that is CBD dominant so that just in case you are sensitive to THC, you can add more CBD as you go. Yeah. And then on the um, – so for around terpenes like we discussed too, so those were our cannabinoids to start for different ailments. Mm. On the terpene side, is it – you know, there's a lot of – if you Google cannabis terpenes, there's a lot of stuff out there about this terpene helps with these certain things and this one with those. Is that more kind of, I don't know if trial by error is the right word because, well, I guess there could be error if like terpinaline, you didn't, that one really didn't right. help you out, but it's kind of, you know, getting your cannabinoid ratios down and then those supplementing those terpenes in and figuring out which just, which one works for you by trying a couple of different ones um, for what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. And there are certain like good general, um, rules or or categories for the different terpenes, like linalool, for example, which is found in lavender, abundantly found in cannabis. That acts as a sedative, um, can also be really helpful for depression. So if you're looking for something, maybe a more calming experience, looking for that terpene may be helpful. Pinene, terpene found in pine needles. Um, Actually, it's greatest therapeutic value is its ability to help offset those negative side effects from THC. Uh, It gives a really kind of clarity of mind uh, experience. It helps to open up the lungs, get more oxygen to the brain, also helps to um, reduce the memory impairment effect that is coming for that may come from THC. So that could be a good one if you're looking to um, maybe incorporate more THC into your lifestyle, but offset those negative side effects. Um, And then there are, of course, tons more in between, like limonene, the citrus terpene, which actually interacts with our serotonin and dopamine. So it could really help boost that anxiolytic effect or anti-anxiety effect. Uh, There's beta caryophylline or caryophylline. I always say that one wrong. um, That can actually engage the endocannabinoid receptor system. So it can uh, effectively engage with our CB2 receptors, causing many medicinal um, kind of pathways to ensue. And so that could also be a good one if you're looking for pain management, muscle relaxation. So there are a lot of ways (laughs) to go, definitely. Um, And there are actually some pretty good resources out there um, online where you can find good terpene information. Um, SC Labs is a good one that I I typically go to. Um, If you are 
interested in getting into the more like nitty gritty research. Dr. Ethan Russo has a lot of research on terpenes out there, um, which could be helpful as well. Okay. Yeah, I know there's quite a few of them. Um, so yeah, figuring out which ones to kind of put together or try is, you know, there's a lot for, I think, a new consumer to kind of figure out and figure out which one they want to try. Definitely. But there's some good stuff out there. Definitely. That's good to know. And I'd like to cover dosing um, recommendations and how to consume. So correct me if I'm wrong. If, if, you're gonna, if we're going to try to make this as simple as possible for a new consumer, there's really oral or inhalation as two of the main methods. There's also transdermal mm -hmm. as another option, um, topical, rub-on. And so for oral, that's always expressed in milligrams for THC. Yes. And your inhalation is percentage of yes. THC. Are those the two kind of measuring metrics that are used for THC and cannabinoids for consumers to look for? Yes, okay. definitely. And what would be a dosing recommendation if they were looking at milligrams or the percentage of THC if they were inhalation? And we kind of hit on it a little bit, but mm. do we want to kind of let them know where they could start? Yeah, definitely. So I am a big supporter um, of microdosing. I think that microdosing is the way to go, especially if you are a novice and you don't have much experience with cannabis. It will just allow you to really like tune into um, what the experience is or even could be if you do need a higher dose without giving you that kind of overwhelming negative uh, experience. And so a good place to start for THC would be about 2.5 milligrams of THC. I do recommend to take it in the evening just mm. in case you experience any adverse events. Um, people are very sensitive or can be very sensitive to THC. And so they can um, experience psychoactivity at one milligram, you know, um, but two and a half milligrams is a good safe place to start for most. Most people don't experience psychoactivity until about five to 10 milligrams. Okay. So two and a half milligrams, good place to start. Take it in the evening. If you don't feel anything the next night or whenever night um, you can increase by one and a half milligrams. And so then you go up to four milligrams of THC. Um, see how it makes you feel. And with ingestion, it is important to note that you should wait at least four hours before consuming more, really when you're starting to figure out what your dose actually is, don't consume any more for that night. Wait until the next evening or even the evening after that um, to really make sure that, that you are understanding your dose, um, especially with oral ingestion of cannabis. It's really dependent on liver processing and metabolic rate. And so it could take you... 24 hours to process it, you know, um, we were not quite there yet with the kind of hard science of yes, you take this milligram amount and every single person will have this effect within this time frame. Uh, and we probably will never get there because of their variability of this medicinal plant. And so wait um, a day and increase your dose. If you do experience psychoactivity at two and a half milligrams, and it is something that you are uncomfortable with, it is not pleasant at all, um, then reduce your dose by one and a half milligrams. So start with one milligram the next night, see how it makes you feel. Um, and note also symptom relief, note like cognitive experience mood as well as symptom relief. Um, and, and that will help you in this kind of dosing structure, figure out, okay, at seven and a half milligrams, I got the relief that I wanted. I maybe am a little high, but I don't have the adverse offense. Um, this is something that I can do. Or, um, if let's say you get to a place where it's just like, this isn't working, I'm not achieving symptom relief, then that's where we look to incorporate maybe some other cannabinoids like CBD into the mix. Um, with oral ingestion of CBD, like we had touched on, you can start at a way higher dosage. So you can start at 15 to 20 milligrams as a microdose. See how it makes you feel. Again, I would recommend to consume in the evening. And that's just so if... If you consume in the morning, then your whole day could be shot. You know, um, the evening is a much safer kind of place. If you do experience adverse events, you could just sleep it off. Um, but yeah, with CBD, it's a higher starting dose there. And then you can work up in kind of five milligram increments. So if you don't experience the symptom relief at 20, go up to 25 the next night, so on and so forth. Um, and if you experience 
maybe something that's uncomfortable, um, and and you're also achieving symptom relief, you can decrease your dose the next okay. night. Yeah. Is there anything um, they could have prepared or ready in case they do overconsume or it's too that experience is too high or anxiety or those things start happening that kind of can help balance um, that experience and level it out for them? Definitely. Yeah. Um, some CBD on hand is mm-hmm. always a good way to go. Uh, that EpiPen of, of mm-hmm. cannabis kind of effect that happens. You can also have um, like black peppercorns people like to chew on. Mm-hmm. We're not sure if that's a placebo effect, <laughs> um, but beta caryophylline is found abundantly in black peppercorn. And so we know that beta caryophylline has an anxiolytic anti-anxiety property associated with it. And so maybe that's what's happening there. Um, It's worked for a lot of people, even if it's placebo. Uh, Also having some lemon balm on hand, um, something citrus maybe so that you get a little added limonene, um, some linalool, aka lavender, to help you kind of calm down. Um, there, there are certain things, certain tools that you can have on hand to help. Um, drinking a lot of water is important. Um, putting on a funny TV show, surrounding yourself with good people, good friends, safe space, all very important things. Um, an intentional cannabis experience, especially when you're first starting out, yeah. is really important. Yeah, that setting of being around friends or family, people you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Because when you first start to experience THC and if you kind of go on a little bit higher end or you're feeling those psychoactive effects, it can feel kind of awkward, especially if you're around strangers or in a foreign environment. But if you're at home with people you really like, that's normally when you just start laughing ridiculously and you can't figure out why or something's goofy. But Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Situational awareness is huge huge um how much water have i had today have i had a fight with my partner was i stressed out at work um how much fat have i eaten because cannabinoids and terpenes are fat soluble so especially if you're ingesting orally that will make a difference Mm. um who am i with where am i at all of these things will contribute to the overall experience and it is important i i think to note beforehand um again if you keep a journal just make quick notes of those things, of course, in addition to what product um, you're actually consuming, how you're consuming, the different ratios of cannabinoids, all those types of things will help you to gather the most data for yourself mm-hmm. for what works for you. Yeah, I think what's great now is as you're starting off as a new consumer, first time user, that kind of incremental process to figure out what works and then you kind of get in your rhythm and you identify a product and you like it. Now, with all the lab testing and the regulations and how you know above board these companies are and the products that are out there, they're so consistent now that if you find something that works, you can be really confident going back to that same product is going to do the same thing time and time again for you, where in the past, I mean, if you had a brownie, you know, if, if something's not potency tested, that's just a huge red flag. There's yeah. an issue there, but <laughs> yeah. we're going even deeper than that and talking about terpenes and full spectrum and these other things where there's this consistency and reliability to the experience now, which is which mm-hmm. is amazing. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that is what the consumer market will start to demand. I mean, they they already have, they yeah. already are. And so it is our job in this industry to give them that uh, degree of predictability and consistency that we can with always the caveat of this is an experiment for you. I can help guide you to the experience that I think that you're looking for based on this chemotypic data or the, the cannabinoid and terpene uh, concentrations as well as the consumption method with all these guidelines for dosing. But ultimately, um, the experience that, that you are going to have is going to be a unique one. And and really, like, tracking that for yourself will help you to find what works best for you. Yeah. I thought this next section could be fun to – so initially I had, you know, what questions should a consumer ask a bud tender when going into a store and then have different product categories. But I thought what we could do is we could go through each product category and if you just want to give me like three questions – Either you would ask a bud tender or a new consumer should ask about those product categories so that they're kind of armed with some information going in to like know what questions to ask, make sure they're getting the right products and a good deal. Um, but we'll just go through product categories and tell me a few questions you'd ask. Yeah, I love that. Tender. It's like lightning round. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're going in to purchase um, flour, 
bud, what would you ask the bud tender? Mm, number one, um, was this grown organically? And how do you make sure of that? If so, um, is there any type of certification on, on the company? Mm. Um, what, it, what are the cannabinoid and terpene potencies? Um, and uh, have you tried it? And mm. how does it make you feel? That's a good one. I like that. Um, vape cartridges. Mm. Um, how was it made? So was it a CO2 process, BHO process? Um, how was it extracted? Um, are there any additives that you know of, like propylene glycol or additional terpenes? Mm -hmm. And uh, what is the, the coil made out of? Is it made out of silica, fiberglass, cotton, ceramics, and... Uh, I'm going to say fourth question, but yeah. um, tell me about the battery that I have to use. Do I have to press it five times? Do I have to press it three times? Are there no buttons? Do I just auto draw? Okay. Yeah. Um, on the CO2 and BHO, I want to go into a few of those a little deeper. Is there specific um, like extracts or concentrates you like or prefer that a consumer could look for for certain reasons? Yeah, I definitely. So I'll preface this by saying I'm not a concentrate girl. Mm. Um, way more of an edibles person. That's like actually my favorite way to consume. Um, but I do use some vape cartridges and typically I stay away from BHO. I just don't like the idea of residual butane, um, in there. Even if the company is telling me that there's not, I'm just skeptical. Um, CO2 or live resin, which is a BHO process, um, but I'll, I'll kind of sacrifice that if I, if I really love the company. Um, CO2 is typically what I look for, um, but I, I really make sure that there's no propylene glycol in there, that it's not cut with anything to uh, decrease its viscosity, because that's typically why. Um, and I also like my CO2 um, oil without any added terpenes specifically any added like synthetic or artificial flavors um not a fan of like the bubblegum vape pen that tastes like bubblegum kind yeah. of thing um so yeah i like a really clean co2 oil that has been processed in such a way that they do preserve as many of those natural terpenes as possible okay uh what would you ask if uh purchasing an edible mm. so uh, what uh concentrate was this made with um was it a CO2, BHO, rosin, or so? Um, how is it dosed or where is the dosing information on the package? Um, and uh, how would you recommend to consume it? Would you recommend to consume it with some additional fat? Um, what is the fat content of that edible? Okay. Uh, what about a tincture? Tincture, uh, again, ask what the solvent is. Is it alcohol, glycerin, oil? Um, where's the dosing information? How, how do I know what uh, half a dropper is versus an eighth of a dropper versus a full dropper? Um, and uh, is this something that I can put into my juices, smoothies, or is it something that you would recommend to put under the tongue and, and hold, the t hold under the tongue? And if so, for how long? Okay. Is there a certain solvent that you prefer in tinctures or is more ideal? Um, I am not a fan of glycerin. That's more of a personal preference, though. I just okay. really don't like the taste. Yeah. Um, I like organic sugarcane alcohol. Um, we've talked a lot about how cannabinoids and terpenes are fat soluble. Hmm. But really, the, the term for it is they're nonpolar, which means that um, they cannot dissolve into water, but they can dissolve into any nonpolar solvent, which is oil or fat or alcohol. Okay. And alcohol, I think, actually does the best job at pulling out the cannabinoids and terpenes. So I like a good alcohol tincture. Um, I also just like I like the way it burns. It makes me feel like it's working. <laughs> <laughs> um but also oil. I'm yeah. also a fan of an oil tincture, yeah. And you need so little with the tincture. Most of the time, they're pretty potent. So yeah. just a few drops. Exactly. Um, and I will kind of add, as like a anything that I'm going to be ingesting specifically um, or even vaping, like where, is the, where are they getting their source material from? Mm -hmm. um, where... Where does this company source their flour from? And do you know the farm's growing practices? Because when we do concentrate down plant material, we're concentrating down whatever inputs were put into mm -hmm. that. Um, and that includes pesticides, fungicides, any 
any synthetic um, nutrients. And that's really important to me, again, to have a, a really clean product. What about for topicals? Topicals. Are you a topical um, user often? I do use topicals sometimes. Um, I I like can't consume actually during the day. Um, I I just usually have a lot of work to do, and cannabis unfortunately does not help me accomplish work. <laughs> I'm not that person, um, but I do have like general muscle pain throughout the day. Uh, I have sciatica, so that's where like a topical comes in handy. Um, so. I'll ask about what the base of it is, if it is a, a butter, what kind of oil it is, um, and if they have any information about um, how it will, like uh, how it how it will be delivered through my skin. Um, if it was cut with anything that did that will make the skin more porous, that will increase the ability for those cannabinoids or terpenes to enter into the skin. Um, I'll also ask how much I should use, how much should I apply, um, and how often would I need to reapply. Okay. And on topicals, as far as dosage, is there any concern or issue there with, you can't, topicals won't get you high, is that correct? It yeah. It doesn't get through the blood-brain barrier by rubbing on the skin? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Our skin is actually really, really thick um, if we look at a cross-section of it. And so the likelihood of it making through, making it through that layer into the bloodstream and getting up to your blood-brain barrier, it's unlikely. I mean, with cannabis, I always give the caveat, anything can happen. Yeah. So you, you never know. Um, and so again, try out a little bit. Usually I recommend on like the inside of the wrist or the ankle where the skin is really thin uh, so that you can just test mostly to see if you have an allergic reaction to any of the things that are included um, in, in the topical because sometimes companies will have like proprietary essential oil blends in there. Um, but typically, no, you should not get high from it and you should be able to reapply it as much as possible. I've heard stories of people who um, use topicals and were like, no, I swear I got high. It's like, okay, did you like eat food with your hands still having the topical oh, on yeah. it? Um, <laughs> did you like happen to smoke weed at one point <laughs> during the day? Like, let's, let's think about this here. And usually um, most people are like, oh yeah, you're right. I did smoke that joint or I yeah. did eat that edible or I did eat food with topical still in my hands. Um, and so, so yeah, typically it shouldn't, okay. but it may. I, I had another question with topicals. I think this would be good for listeners. I was actually really suspicious of them when you know the legalized market came out. And because of that, that you can't get high from them, it doesn't go to the blood-brain barrier. So my thought was like, well, what are they even doing? To me, they're just sitting on top of your skin. That's great. But how are they working? But you've actually told me they have – you do have receptors that react with topicals in your skin to, that, that makes it – actually topicals are effective and do actually work yes yes okay. we do have endocannabinoid receptors in our skin we also have a family of receptors called trpv1 receptors that cannabinoids can and do engage with mm. um that help to reduce inflammation and decrease uh sensitivity to pain okay interesting well that was the end of um kind of the questions i had planned and then i've got a series of questions from that listeners submitted if you want to walk through those and then yeah wrap up let's do it all right. What is the best way to ingest cannabis with the least amount of side effects? Mm, so any form. So like consume cannabis, yeah, not consuming. okay. Yeah. Um, I would say it depends on what the side effects are, what you're trying to avoid. If it is that anxiety, paranoia, uh, memory impairment, um, I would say look more to to the actual compounds. Um. CBD and pinene, that terpene that I mentioned, are actually good at helping to reduce the negative side effects um, that come from THC. And so incorporating a little bit more CBD maybe mm -hmm. into uh, whatever you're consuming and making sure that it does have high pinene levels could help. Uh, I would not suggest uh, eating an edible just because uh, it can last and, and be in your system for a very long time. Some right. people could still be high like 48 hours after. After they've consumed. Again, that's atypical, but it does happen. Um, I'd say vaping is probably the way to go. Um, it just allows you to, first of all, like measure your dose better. We're smoking. Uh, it's harder to microdose. You could get through half a joint and then 
just like 20 minutes later be like oh my god i'm really high where vaping every like two to five second draw is typically just about two to five milligrams of thc if you have a thc dominant uh concentrate in there and so it's easier to kind of modulate the dose okay what's a standard edible um like length of experience would you say standard i'd say is about four to seven hours four to seven yeah okay what benefits does eating the raw plant have? Mm, so this has actually come up a lot recently, um, just in questions that I've been getting. Uh, and I, I think that there is this trend towards consuming the raw cat cannabinoids. So when we smoke or, or vape or eat an edible, um, the cannabinoids that we are consuming have been activated. They've been changed from their acidic form uh, into their quote unquote active form. However, a lot of people juice uh, cannabis leaves in order to get those acidic compounds. Mm. And while we don't have enough research to draw conclusive um evidence or to claim kind of conclusive uh, experience or properties of these acidic cannabinoids, there is research to suggest that uh, consuming raw cannabis and consuming those acidic cannabinoids can have um, potent anti-inflammatory efficacy in particular, um, and that those acidic cannabinoids, especially if consumed through the digestive system, are actually very bioavailable. So they're, they are more bioavailable than the cannabinoids in their active form, which is interesting. Um, shouldn't really get you high. Um, however, I just consumed uh, some CBDA, uh, so the acidic form of CBDA coming or or packaged in a full spectrum hemp mm. uh, product, and I definitely felt some type of way. Um, mm. I was definitely like relaxed. My mood was elevated. No, it was not the THC like high. Thank goodness, I was happy for mm. that. Um, but I I definitely felt a change in my cognition for sure. Okay. Oh, um, so we were talking about full spectrum earlier. I've always understood hemp to really be, you know, it grows, there's CBD in there, but it's mostly only CBD that the hemp plant grows. But you just said full spectrum hemp. Are there now hemp strains or plants that are actually growing a more full spectrum profile and not just like isolated CBD? Mm, so full spectrum just means that it's the full range or close to the full range of secondary compounds that that plant has produced. And so while it's CBD dominant, it Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's only producing CBD as its only secondary compound. Um, Hemp, its legal status is defined by having less than 0.03% THC. So it could still have 0.02% THC, um, which if it's included in a full spectrum hemp product, there could be a little bit of THC in there. Um, And the hemp plant also produces terpenes and flavonoids and and other compounds as well. Um, Again, not as much as the cannabis plant, as the Mm -hmm. drug cultivar cannabis, um, but it's you can still have a full spectrum hemp product. Okay. Is that something a consumer should look out for, especially if ordering from an online company that they might say this is full spectrum extract, which it very well, well be, but if their their input material, the plant they start with is low quality, it could still be full spectrum, but you're not getting all these different terpenes or secondary compounds. Definitely. So really lab results, I suppose. Lab results, yes. Making sure that you really do some research as to um, what company you're sourcing from. That is the biggest, biggest piece of advice that I give to people who are looking to incorporate CBD into their lifestyle but don't have access to legal cannabis. So they're looking to hemp, research the company, reach out to them, ask them if they have lab testing done, yeah. um, ask them about their practices, ask them where they source from. If they don't give you any information, that's a good kind of red flag right. <laughs> to, to maybe move on to another company. Certainly. Um. I've seen people, oh, well, we kind of just hit on this. I've seen people juice plants before, but can you get high from that? And you that's could. where it could potentially. You, you could. Um, again, atypical. I feel like I've said this word <laughs> like a million times in this episode. Cover all the bases, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just know. again, um, you shouldn't because it's a, it's an acidic Um form of the cannabinoid, which means that it can't effectively engage with the endocannabinoid receptors. So it can't really trigger that psychoactive experience. But um, 
if you're using something like a Vitamix per se, there may be high enough heat in there mm. that some of that uh, some of those acidic compounds have now turned into activated forms of THC. Um, we're not we're not still like really a hundred percent clear on what's happening through the digestive system, and so um, so I would say that that you can. Um, and like I had mentioned with my own personal anecdote, even from CBD, I definitely felt a change in my cognition. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I would call it high in, in the way that we think about a, a THC high, but right. there was definitely a, a change in my mood there. Hmm. Um, we covered the ratio one-to-one THC CBD. Does your body build up a tolerance to CBD? Hmm. So that's a a good question. Um, Your body can build up a tolerance to almost anything. Um, Really, when we talk about tolerance with cannabis, we talk more about the way that THC tolerance happens. Um, And so we can definitely build up a tolerance to THC. Um, Most people know that who are avid consumers. The cool thing is, is that it only takes 48 hours to reset your tolerance Mm. from a tolerance break. Um, CBD, we don't build up a tolerance to CBD in that same way. So um, CBD especially has the ability to really interact and support um, our endogenous cannabinoids. So our cannabinoids that our body makes itself, um, by helping to reduce this compound that floats around in the body called FAAH. It's a fatty acid that uh, is made when we are stressed. Mm -hmm. And when we are stressed, um, no matter what type of stress it is, the body makes that compound and then stores it in storage uh, vesicles for later use. And when our body makes an endogenous cannabinoid called anandamide, this FAAH that's just floating around can immediately denature anandamide. So it's one of the compounds that can actually destroy anandamide before it even has an ability to engage with our system. Um, What CBD can do is it can destroy FAAH. Hmm. And so thereby it supports anandamide's ability to engage with our endocannabinoid receptor system, um, creating a a kind of opportunity for us to not need as to supplement with as many phytocannabinoids, which is interesting. Mm. Um, And so, so we can't really, in, in that kind of sense, CBD actually helps to support the functioning of our own endogenous system. Um, And so there's not this kind of like super tolerance buildup there. Um, I will say that, especially in the way that it combines with THC, that if we're building up our THC tolerance, it'll probably take way more CBD to then help balance that out, uh, if that makes sense. Um, But we don't build tolerance to CBD in the same way that we do to THC. Okay. That makes sense. Will I fail a drug test consuming CBD? I'm going to abstain from answering that because you very well may. (laughs) Um, And there was actually that very unfortunate story that came out um, uh, several months ago about the bus driver from, it was, uh, I think maybe from Beaverton, somewhere in right outside of Portland. um, There was a bus driver who was taking, uh, or he claims he was only consuming hemp CBD and um, he failed his drug test, unfortunately. Um, and so you very well may. Um, if you are somebody who has to have regular drug testing for whatever reason, um, I would stay away from cannabis, unfortunately. Yeah. Um just because there are those kind of accounts and reports of people, even with hemp derived CBD um, that has less than that 0.03% THC still failing drug tests by like quite a large margin. Yeah. And my understanding of that was if, if you truly had CBD 100% isolated, you consume that you would pass a drug test with only CBD if that's all there was. But so often the case is there is a very small amount of THC that is in hemp that is in there and that comes along with that just hemp derived cbd that you're getting so that's what's causing you to fail the drug test but in theory if it was 100 percent pure cbd you would be able to pass i believe is that accurate it is because um drug tests 
for or to detect cannabis use are only testing for THC. Okay, that's what they're, um, for. they're not testing for CBD, at least to my knowledge uh, <laughs> now. Um, however, I think that anybody in the cannabis business, so anybody as an industry professional, you should never really assure people that they'll pass yeah, a drug test if they use risky. any type of hemp or cannabis product, uh, just because it's a huge liability. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you never know what could happen. We, mm. We're just not there yet with that kind of hard science. Um, and quite frankly, I don't know if we ever will get there. Yeah. Hopefully we'll get somewhere where we stop somewhere drug close. testing. Exactly. That, yeah. that would be the, the true goal yeah. when we can stop drug Sounds testing. Yeah. yeah. Um, can dogs have CBD? And is it a different kind if so? Pets can definitely have CBD. Um, it's not a different kind. So uh, that's actually a good point to make in that CBD that comes from hemp and CBD that comes from cannabis and CBD that comes from other sources Um it's the same exact molecular structure all across the board. Um, it's just the the different supporting compounds that are within those different matrices that will influence the way that mm. CBD can interact with your physiology. But um, CBD for pets is the same CBD that, that you can take as a human. Mm. Um, and there are many dog treats that I'm seeing now, even yeah. in supermarkets, um, here in Oregon, at least where there is a good amount of CBD. Um, I know that my very good friends, they have cats and they give their cats CBD tincture and mm. the cats love it. Really? They are just like, mm. they chill, they eat, they sleep. Um, and they're typically very anxious cats. So yeah. it's nice to see them kind of calm a down. Little, little. Yeah. <laughs> what about THC for dogs or cats? No, not great. Mm. Um, I know people who have had pets with who were going through like cancer or again, more of those severe medical conditions that they did choose to um, dose them with a little bit of THC just to try to help ease mm. the pain more and um, maybe even hopefully help to to like manage the disease, um, give them a, a longer, better quality of life. It's just hard when we talk about giving an animal THC because they can't communicate their experiences yeah. to us. And so if they are having a really paranoid time inside their head, um, I bet that would just be so uncomfortable for them and could definitely increase neurotic behavior if your your goal is to decrease neurotic behavior. Yeah. I would suggest staying away from it. Um, or if you are like really hell bent on trying it um, for a pet that does have maybe cancer or something like that, do a very, very low dose. Low amount. Um, so on oral consumption of CBD in relation to child development, um, dosage effects on mental and physical health de development and CBD, I've seen more stories, um, around children, epilepsy, it's, it's working there. Is there any concerns or side effects or that would, you know, around CBD with children? Mm. So I haven't seen any research that's looked at the long-term use of CBD and its effects um, on the brain, the heart, the lungs. That's typically what researchers look to okay. um, in terms of like long-term adverse events. Uh, there was that research paper that actually we discussed in the last episode that we did together um, that came out in January um, looking at different dosing methods um, and also different uh, adverse events that have been associated with cannabis use. And there was a study out of Canada that was done that showed no long-term um, adverse events associated with cannabis use, uh, specifically looking at brain, heart, and lung function, okay. which was awesome. Yeah. Um, however, there has been research to suggest that especially in young developing brains, THC specifically um, can impair memory uh, and definitely lead to uh, memory loss. Uh, it's kind of the opposite in the older populations, mm. which is interesting in that THC uh, and cannabis in general can help to reverse that uh, memory loss, which That's is cool. Um, but that I, I would say is the major adverse event that has been associated with cannabis use in young people. Uh, that being said, I don't think that that is uh, correlated to CBD. I think right. that's specific to THC. Um, and that may just be because we don't have that long-term research yet because the the kind of start of children consuming CBD oil um, to help with 
with seizure disorders has just started happening over the last like decade. Um, and so I'm sure more research will come out to that. And hopefully we will see that there are no adverse events associated with long term use. But specifically in that case, I'd say, well, if you have a child who was having 40 seizures a day or even 100 seizures a day, and now they're taking this CBD dominant oil and they're having maybe one to five seizures a day, I think that that benefit outweighs any potential memory right. impairment. Um, but that's also just my opinion. Sure. Um, what's the difference between traditional full spectrum RSO and the new activated BHO or CO2 oil that is being marketed as full extract cannabis oil, which is then clear or when it is clear. Mm. So that's a different that's a difference in solvent. So um, RSO or FICO, full extract cannabis oil, um, it is made with hopefully made with organic um, food grade alcohol. And like I had mentioned, that is really the best solvent to pull out those cannabinoids and terpenes. Um, it's also if it is true FICO, true full extract. It has been done at a very low temp so that you are preserving as many compounds as possible. And it's been extracted for a very long time. Um, so usually you still have a lot of plant material um, mm. in there, which is a good clue that uh, your extract has a truly full spectrum if you have little particulates, little plant material, because in order to really extract out your plant waxes, your plant phenols, um, you need high temp, typically. I'm sure there's some proprietary process out there that um, will contradict me. But um, from what I've seen and from what I know, really to get that clear oil um, that relates to the second part of the question, you do need high temp. And so for the CO2 and the BHO that's been that's being marketed as full extract, uh, they may be doing like a a low temp process first, pulling out some terpenes, um, pulling out uh, some of those more volatile compounds, and then running the remaining oil through a higher temp, higher pressure mm. extraction, and then kind of like putting those two pieces Back together. Um, they also could just be running a very low and slow process, um, which could create a full spectrum oil. Um, I have consumed and I know companies that do this with CO2 and their oil is very clear. Um, it is darker in color. It's mm. more amber, but it is, it's, uh, doesn't have particulates, which could mean that they just like did a very, um, rigorous winterization process where they do wash it with ethanol, um, and and store it in a really cool place to try to pull out as many plant waxes as possible. So it is absolutely possible to have a full spectrum CO2 oil um, that I've consumed, that I know. Um, it still may not have the same efficacy as a full spectrum or a full extract cannabis oil that has been uh, extracted with the food grade organic alcohol, just because that alcohol is such a powerful solvent at pulling everything out. Um, with BHO, you typically need high temp, high pressure. Mm. I have not personally seen um, an, a BHO extract that has been done low temp for a very long time that also has pulled out any of the residual butane solvent. So that would be my one concern um, and definitely something that I would ask a company who is making BHO where they did claim full extract was, okay, well, how are you making sure that, one, you're preserving as many compounds as possible? What is your extraction length? What's your temperature look like? Um, and how are you ensuring that you're pulling out as much butane in the process? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, the full spectrum term, because in any process, there's going to be some efficiency losses. So probably not 100% conversion from the flower, maybe even in the most ideal, perfect world. Right. Something is, even when you harvest a flower, terpenes are, you know, are aromatic and you're, you're losing some of them. But what is the most effective at consuming most of the, getting most of the terpenes and cannabinoids into that product? Mm -hmm, definitely. Got one, I can send that later. 
It looks good. Um, well, that was all the questions I had. Do you want to let know people know where they can find you um, if they want to learn more, see what you're doing, or where you're yeah, at? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I do have a website. You can find me at emmachason.com. There's a contact form there. Um, so please feel free to get in touch with any questions that you may have. Um, I'm also on pretty much all the socials. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn. If anybody's looking for, for some business development connection. Um, so yeah, please, please feel free to, to reach out through any of the channels. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emma. That was oh really great. yeah. I'm so glad to, to be back. Yeah. Hopefully. I think we provided a nice foundation for a new consumer and that I think so. arm them with quite a bit of information and knowledge and ready to go out into the world. Yes. Of dispensaries. Go yeah. out into the <laughs> cannabis world and feel confident to yeah. be able to, to try this out. I think cannabis can be for everybody, but it's about knowing the right questions to ask. So yep. this has been great. Definitely. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Emma. All right. That was the episode. Hopefully you found that one informational as well as uh, kind of entertaining as well. Emma's got a great way of explaining these complex ideas, um, you know, because cannabis and the science is really complex as we're learning more and more. And there's so many nuances, but she really articulates them and breaks them down in just a nice way. And it's not dry or dull. You know, sometimes science, if you get a little too you know, geeking out on it can be that way if you're not exactly interested in it or the science of things. But Emma does an amazing job of not only just telling the information, articulating it, making it understanding, but also in a way entertaining. And again, I don't, I'm going to try to stress this enough. Share with your friends and family. That's what we made this episode for. Um, bud tenders that want to learn more, you know, grandma that's might be interested in cannabis, but she still has a stigma. Hopefully these episodes, these past uh, 50 and 51 will help remove that and just expose a couple people to a new side of cannabis that they might not even been aware uh, was out there. So if you're listening on your phone, um, whatever podcast app you're listening on or our own app, just uh, screenshot that while you're listening and upload to Instagram, upload to Facebook, and just tell your friends. Look for Periodic Effects either on a podcast app, iTunes, or go to the App Store and look for Periodic Effects. We've got an app that'll show up. They can listen that way. Super, super easy. And or then go to the website. So we do have a landing page, like I said in the intro, www.periodicaffects.com slash 101. And that's it. So thanks for joining us again this week. We'll be back next week. Remember, every Monday is when we upload new episodes. So check back next Monday afternoon. We'll have a new one out. And we'll talk then. Have an amazing week. Thank you.